Welcome to the second video in the Essential Extract Vector Calculus series. In this video, we're going to talk about the differential operators gradient, divergence, and curl. We'll give the definitions of those operators, and we'll also define what it means for a vector field to be conservative, solenoidal, or irrotational. We'll also talk about a theorem called the Fundamental Theorem of Vector Calculus, or the Helmholtz decomposition. And at the end, we'll talk about the relationship between conservative and irrotational fields. If you're following along in the Vector Calculus handout, what we're going to be talking about is what's covered in the top right-hand corner, together with some of what's covered in the section about conservativity and independence of path. We're not going to talk about independence of path in this video. That's going to come in a later video. But what we're going to talk about in this video is going to lay some of the foundation for that discussion. I also wanted to mention that a lot of the notation that I'm going to be using in this video was explained in the first video. So if you have any questions about that, you can try going back to the first video and see if that helps. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. The first operator on our list is the gradient operator. The gradient operator is an operator that takes scalar fields on Rn and turns them into vector fields on Rn. Remember that a scalar field on Rn is just a function from some subset d of Rn to R. We do need to make some assumptions here. It's probably a good idea at this stage to assume that d is an open set. And we also want to assume that all the partial derivatives of f on d exist. If our scalar field satisfies these assumptions, then the gradient of f is defined to be the vector field whose ith component is given by taking the partial derivative of f with respect to xi. The symbol that we use to denote this function is upside down delta f. And just to make sure that you understand, this function takes as its input a point in the set d, which is an n-tuple of real numbers, and it outputs a vector in vn whose ith component is given by the partial derivative of f with respect to xi evaluated at that point. I'll give you an example in just a minute to make sure that we all understand the definition. One important significance of the gradient operator, which I'm sure that you know if you've taken multivariable calculus, is that the gradient points in the direction of maximum increase of the function. In other words, if you're at the point x1 to xn in d, the vector that you get by evaluating the right-hand side of this function points in the direction of maximum increase at that point. There's another common notation for the gradient. Some people also denote it by writing grad of f. And people colloquially often refer to this operator just as del f. So if you see somebody talking about del f in the context of vector calculus, they're probably talking about the gradient operator. Before we go on, although we're not going to be too concerned with this, I do want to tell you briefly what the definition of an open set is. An open set in Euclidean space is a set like the one on the top left here, with the property that, for every point in the set, I can find some ball around that point which is completely contained in the set. Another way to characterize open sets is that open sets are sets which don't contain any of their boundary points. If you look at the three sets on the bottom here, you can see that in all three of the examples that I've given on the bottom, there are points on the boundary which don't have the property that I described above. On the other hand, all the sets on the top do have this property. It's also worth pointing out that no matter what n is, rn itself always satisfies the definition of being an open set. As promised, now let's look at an example. For the example, let's take the scalar field in three dimensions defined by f of x, y, z equals 1 over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus c squared. This function is not defined at the origin, so I have to throw that point out of the domain of definition, but the resulting set d is still an open set. We're not going to worry too much about details like that as we go on. I'm just pointing it out since we just talked about open sets. Now let's try to compute the gradient of this function. Remember, the gradient of this function is going to be a vector field. In other words, it's going to take in a point x, y, z from the set d, and it's going to output a vector in v3. The first component of this vector is going to be the partial derivative of f with respect to x. The second component is going to be with respect to y, and the third component with respect to z. I'll leave it for you to compute those partial derivatives, but when you do so, hopefully this is what you'll get. I just want to clean this answer up a little bit because this is an example that I'm going to use again in a few minutes. Let's write x with an arrow over it for the vector x, y, z. Then the length of x is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So the denominator of each one of the components of this vector field is the length of x cubed. From that observation, hopefully you can see without much trouble that the gradient operator can also be written as 1 over the length of x squared times negative x divided by the length of x. In case you're wondering why I'm writing it this way, I'll try to explain in a few minutes when we do our next example. Vector fields like the one that we just saw that can be written as the gradient of a scalar field play an important role in this subject. If a vector field capital F can be written as the gradient of a scalar function little f, then we say that the vector field is a conservative vector field. 
and we also call the function little f a scalar potential for capital F. Before we move on, let's look at an important example from physics. If you've taken basic physics, then you probably know that given two point masses, big M and little m in space, the gravitational force exerted on little m by big M is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two points. Also, of course, that force has a direction. It points from the point little m to the point big M. We can record this as a vector field on R3. The force acting on the point xyz is the product of the masses of the objects times the gravitational constant divided by the distance squared between the two points times a unit vector pointing from the point x to the origin. Here I've chosen my coordinates so that the point big M lies at the origin. Now hopefully you realize why we left the final example the way that we did. It turns out that this force is the gradient of the function little f given by little m times big M times the gravitational constant divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared plus c squared. The proof of this is just the computation that we did in the previous example. To put this in the language that we defined on the previous slide, this calculation shows that the force of gravity is a conservative force. This has important physical consequences, and it's not an isolated result. We'll talk about some of the consequences of conservativity later on in this video and also in some of the later videos. Next let's talk about the divergence operator. The divergence operator is a little different than the gradient operator. Instead of taking a scalar field and producing a vector field like the gradient does, the divergence operator takes as its input a vector field on Rn and outputs a scalar field on Rn. Of course, you need some basic assumptions in order to define this operator. For us right now, it's probably enough just to assume that we have a vector field capital F defined on some open subset of Rn with the property that all of the partial derivatives of all of the component functions of capital F exist on D. In order to make the definition, I've labeled the component functions of capital F as little f sub 1, little f sub 2, dot dot dot, little f sub n. The divergence of the vector field capital F, which is denoted by del dot f, is the scalar field that you get by taking the partial derivative of f1 with respect to x1, plus the partial derivative of f2 with respect to x2, plus dot 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 partial of fn with respect to xn. The reason for the notation del dot f should be pretty obvious. It's because in the definition, it's as if you're taking the dot product of the vector of partial derivative operators partial with respect to xi, with the vector of component functions fi. Another common notation for this operator is just to write it as div f, and sometimes people pronounce the divergence operator as del dot f. Remember that since the divergence of a vector field is itself a scalar field, it takes as its input a point x1 to xn in the set D and outputs a real number. That real number also has a physical significance. It tells us how much of the vector field capital F is coming into or going out of an infinitesimally small region around the point x1 to xn. If it turns out that the divergence of our vector field is the scalar function which always outputs zero, then we say that the vector field capital F is a solenoidal vector field. The physical significance here is that when you have a solenoidal vector field in an infinitesimal region around any point, the vectors are just circulating around without any net input or output at that point. There's a very nice theorem, which I can state now but without proof, and it's called the Helmholtz Decomposition Theorem, or the Fundamental Theorem of Vector Calculus. In the previous example, I mentioned that conservative vector fields play a special role in the subject. Well, not every vector field is conservative. However, it turns out that if you have a vector field on any bounded subset of R3, which has continuous second partial derivatives, then it can always be written as a sum of two vector fields, one of which is conservative and the other of which is solenoidal. There's also an explicit formula for the conservative and solenoidal parts, but it's too early at this point for me to show you those formulas. In any case, this is a useful result in some physical problems. Finally, let's talk about the curl operator. Unlike the gradient and divergence operators, the curl operator is an operator that's defined only in three dimensions. It takes as its input a vector field in three dimensions, and it outputs another vector field. The notation for the curl operator is del cross f, or del times f. The formula for the curl operator is a little harder to remember than the formulas for the other operators. If the component functions of the vector field capital F are p, q, and r, then del cross f is defined to be the vector field whose first component function is the partial derivative of r with respect to y minus partial of q with respect to z, and whose second and third component functions are given in a similar way by the formulas here. 
This formula may look slightly strange. One way that you can remember the formula is to remember it as the curl of the vector whose components are the partial derivative operators, partial with respect to x, y, and z, with the vector whose components are p, q, and r. That of course is the reason for the notation del cross f. It's also common to write the curl operator just as curl of f, and a lot of times you'll just hear people refer to this as del cross f. The curl operator attaches to every point in R3 a vector in V3. This vector has a physical significance. The magnitude of this vector tells you, in an infinitesimally small region around each point, how fast the vectors of f are spinning around that point. The direction that this vector points is perpendicular to the direction of the spin, and the orientation of the vector is determined by the right-hand rule for vectors. Next we're going to briefly mention a couple basic properties of the curl operator. First of all, if you start with a vector field in R3 and take its curl, you'll get another vector field in R3. If you then take the divergence of that vector field, you'll always get the scalar field zero. In other words, to put this in the language that we introduced earlier in the video, curl fields are solenoidal vector fields. Before I tell you the second property of the curl operator, let me introduce a little definition. A vector field f in R3 with the property that its curl is the zero vector field is called irrotational. You can think about it this way. Irrotational is to the curl operator what solenoidal is to the divergence operator. It's easy to remember which adjectives to attach to which operator if you just think about what they mean. If you say that a vector field in R3 is irrotational, it essentially means that the net spin about every point is the zero vector. On the other hand, if you say that a vector field is solenoidal, it means that the net influx or outflux at each point is zero. In other words, the vector field is just spinning around every point, which might remind you of a solenoid in physics. Now, the second property of the curl operator that I want to mention is that if you take the gradient of a scalar field and then compute its curl, you always get the zero vector field. Another way to say that using the language that we've introduced in this video is that conservative vector fields are irrotational. Now, you might wonder, especially after doing a lot of examples, whether there's a converse of this statement. What we're saying here is that if a vector field in three dimensions is conservative, then it's irrotational. The question is, is it also true that every irrotational vector field in R3 is conservative? Well, the answer to that question is no in general. However, with a somewhat mild assumption on the domain D of the vector field, we get an equivalence between conservative vector fields and irrotational vector fields. The extra assumption that we need to make is that the domain D is a simply connected open set. And we also technically need to assume that the first partial derivatives of f exist and are continuous. As long as D and f satisfy these hypotheses, if f is an irrotational vector field, then it has to also be conservative. Therefore, from what we've said, under these hypotheses, f is conservative if and only if it's irrotational. This is the last thing that I want to mention in this video, but before we go, I guess I owe it to you to tell you briefly what simply connected means. For a subset of Rn to be simply connected, two requirements have to be satisfied. The first requirement is that the set has to be path connected. That just means that for any two points in the set, there has to be a way of drawing a continuous path between them without leaving the set. That rules out sets like the one at the bottom here, which is a disjoint union of two disks. If I pick a point in the left disk and a point in the right disk, there's no way to draw a continuous path between them without leaving the set. The second requirement that has to be satisfied is that if you have any closed loop in the set, you have to be able to shrink it down to a point without leaving the set. That essentially means that your sets can't have any holes in them. In the first two examples in the bottom here, if I had a closed loop that went one time around this hole or one time around either one of these holes, there would be no way to shrink it down to a point without leaving the set even if I just took R2 and removed one point from the middle. If I had a closed loop which went one time around the origin, there would be no way to shrink it down to one point without leaving the set. The three sets at the top here are examples of regions which are simply connected because they satisfy both of the requirements that I just mentioned. The definition is the same in any number of dimensions, but just to make sure that your intuition is correct, let's look at a few more examples. These are all examples in three-dimensional Euclidean space. The example on the bottom right is not simply connected because it doesn't meet the first requirement that I mentioned. It's not path connected. The example on the bottom left is path connected, but if I have a loop that goes one time around, you're not going to be able to continuously contract it down to a point without leaving the set. Therefore, this is also not a simply connected region. The region on the top left, which is supposed to be a solid sphere in three dimensions, is a simply connected region. Similarly, all of R3 is also a simply connected region. 
Here, however, things are a little bit different than they were in two dimensions, because even if we remove the point at the origin, the resulting set is still simply connected. If we have any closed loop in this set, we can always shrink it down to a point and just avoid the origin. That's all you really need to know about simply connected regions for the purposes of these videos. That's the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Next time, we're going to talk about parametrizing curves and surfaces by vector functions.